Hello, innovators. I'm Dustin Miller, Poly Innovator. Today, I'm talking with Martin Ristoff, a holistic well-being expert, private bliss coach, biohacker, philosopher, entrepreneur, author, speaker, and coach. Welcome to the Polymath Polycast. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Dustin. It's a pleasure to have this conversation with you today again and catching up again and uh, to be of service to whoever yeah. made a wide choice to join us today for this insightful conversation. Hello and welcome to the Polymath Polycast. Well, thanks for saying hello to the innovators there. I, I kind of feel like people who are listening in on this are the people who are innovative in life, either they're polymathic or just all in all just innovative people. The way I like to break the ice is to have you share something about yourself that no one knows about you. Ah, well, there's so many things nobody knows about me or people <laughs> that don't know me well don't know about me, but... I would say that I'm probably uh, just uh, uh, ran into a, a, a lady I recently met on the beach, but point being, she just like synchronously was passing by. I was out for a walk and she met me and uh, she would, took a walk for a moment while I was uh, kind of like trying to get away from the computer before yeah. I came back to, to, to have our conversation. And she was like, wow, you like really like, almost like OCD. And I'm like, well, not necessarily. I call it organized mind because, mm. you know, to have an organized mind is actually order. Like if you study the universe as a whole, you're going to see that there are two fundamental forces that are in opposition with each other. One is the order of evolution or sort of like order. And the other one is chaos or dissonance or what entropy. science would call entropy. Yeah. Right. So in my case, something that people don't know about me, uh -huh. that is just very off top of my head right now is that I'm very organized. I like to organize, not just my thought, my space, everything, because an organized space translate into an organized mind An organized mind, obviously being polymatic or being interested in various, uh, uh -huh. what, a normal person would consider disconnected disciplines can actually see all the patterns and how, how all the dots connect. And mm -hmm. that's, I think, one of the unique uh, traits that I've developed, not just in this lifetime, but that's, a, that's an ongoing process that's been going on for many reincarnation. And then there are no random things in, in this universe. Everything is by merit. There is a reason behind it. There is a cost to each effect. and. You know, I was born this way. It wasn't something that I kind of like develop overnight. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a good uh, thing to share on that point. I think so too. I, I always found that there are people who are kind of born it into, actually there's a lot of people who are, not a lot of people. We have to get my train of thought. There are people who are born into it, but there's a lot more people who are more adapted to it. But the ones who are born to it are kind of like those natural talented people in the world when it comes to any kind of talent. But my point is like they're more talented towards that divergence, the polymathic lifestyle. When you're born into it, it's just natural for us. You know what I mean? Whereas people who adapt to it have to kind of learn it more. Oh, no, absolutely. Well, it has to do with actually which side of your brain you're using. Once you like have some comprehension of uh, how the different hemispheres of the brain work, the left, the rational, the logical side is actually focused with dissecting and individually looking at things where the right side is the one that's looking at the big abstract picture is looking how all the little pieces actually fit together because if i was to dissect you into pieces and study you and then try to put you back together you're not going to function as you function right now so <laughs> hence does you know if we are to analyze things in their granular makeup we don't see that magic that happens when all the pieces are united together through evolutionary process versus human <laughs> human ingenuity so to speak there is that like one plus one equals 11 versus one plus one equals two there is like a significant a difference and i think that's kind of like where or what is unique in, in the way we function or people that are very multi-dimensional they use the I would say not just one side of the brain, but are very adept at using both. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and one thing that you mentioned too is the organizational kind of order versus chaos. And the universe is constantly going towards entropy. But as humans, as people, as living beings, we are trying to organize our life. We're trying to find order and create it if we have to. And that's how society is formed. That's how governments are formed. That's how our lives are organized. Just before this call, I was spending a ton of time planning out my content ahead of time, organizing it into different categories and different series. And then probably after this call, I'll go back and actually set out dates for the next year. I'm trying to actually plan out the next year of content and just plan out each week that I'm going to do. And because of that, it's going to get me able to do a lot more. And I feel like that's a good example of what you were talking about. No, absolutely. I just uh, did my calendar for the upcoming month. I like to like, there are certain things like a must do task that I mm-hmm. set on the calendar a month, you know, in a, I won't say month in advance, but since today is the 31st, like it takes me a while to really, because I have a very uh, complex system <laughs> mm-hmm. organizing my days and staying productive and tracking my progress and so mm-hmm. on and so on that I've developed over the years by using other systems that are out there. And well, let me, let me touch on that then with you before I get to the questions. Sure. What tool are you using to organize it? I just use Excel okay. because they have a lot of freedom to create a, a sheet that really is custom to my needs, so to speak. Mm-hmm. There are many tools, but, you know, I, I like Excel for that purpose. But again, obviously, there are many tools and just like over the years, I put so much time and effort to get it mm-hmm. to where it works for me to translate it into something else and you know learn a new platform to use just for that reason it doesn't make any sense you know what i mean it's already like capable enough i can re- you know run formulas or all kinds of stuff in it if i wanted to but point being and i like it because it's very colorful and i can color things yeah. based on their priority or kind of like intention so to speak that's kind of the same old reason why I moved, actually, because I wasn't able to make it as colorful as I'd wanted or as organized as I wanted, per se. But I also didn't know formulas myself. So when it came to Excel or, you know, Google Sheets, I can only do so much. But I, w- I moved to, like, oh, Airtable, for example, because I was able to group things together differently. But if it works for you, that's what matters. I've always tried to encourage people to try out new things, but you also got to stick with what works. Had I stuck with Notion at the beginning of the year, I'd probably be a little bit farther ahead than where I am now. But because I also moved, I also feel like I might have accelerated some progress as well. So it's it's a balance. Like by moving, I think I found a better tool for myself, but by staying, I could have probably got more done. So it's also kind of interesting that way. No, absolutely. I've experimented with Airtable. It's definitely a good platform. It's just like anything else. If you want to take full advantage of its potential we have to spend time to really learn the intricate little things how to connect things and Mm -hmm. get get to play around and you know at this point i have other priorities than uh learning another platform to use you know like i've been learning many many things i always learn something new anyway so like i have i guess when you have you know the what i would say uh insatiable curiosity always has different something. interest to balance <laughs> and create like a harmony that works and based yeah. on my current goals right now one of those platforms sitting down to learn is a waste of time yeah like from my perspective but it's definitely useful i've heard very good things about it well and Airtable is not even the one i'm using i was just using it as an example there uh capacities is what i use but the point is the point remains of like what you are interested in and organizing your life and finding a system that works and that's really kind of what I wanted to get into there because I feel like a lot of people who might be listening in too, they don't have a system. And that's actually why I create content around that. But getting into the questions here, what was your mindset five years ago and how have you changed since then? Uh, honestly, that's a good question. I don't have a mindset. I have an open mind. My mind is always growing. So mindset mm-hmm. to me means your mind is set. It's like pouring concrete and turning into this stable, very hard to, to break form. So I'm always challenging my assumptions because a mindset is an assumption. Once Mm -hmm. you understand all the rational experiences you have, rational thoughts you create that are just assumptions because they're derived in a flawed process called reasoning, which revolves using your five bodily senses to make sense of what's going on. However, science beyond any 
reasonable doubt proves that our senses are neither objective nor complete in their ability to grasp the data that comes at us. You get to the point where, okay, you have a deeper comprehension that your assumptions are always probable in a sense that they're not absolute. Mm -hmm. So there's always ways to fine tune your thinking. So I'm constantly upgrading the process, right? I don't have a set mindset. I have an open mind and I stretch it every day. It's like mental gym, right? The beautiful thing about the mind, since it's metaphysical or doesn't exist in a physical space, it's very, very easy to stretch. It doesn't have a limit on how much it can grow, right? There's this concept that once your mind expands, it can never shrink. Mm. So my mindset is always... If to put it this way, to use that term, right, to not get caught up in the terms is to always challenge my assumptions, all my beliefs and everything that I have no validity for. Meaning like, because when you have a belief about something, right, it's an assumption. It's not validated. The moment you validate it or disprove it, now it's no longer a belief. It's either a false belief or it's a direct experience, which it's very different from having a belief. Belief is something... It's like a, what in science they call a hypothesis, a hypothesis or theory. Mm -hmm. It's valid until it's proven wrong. Mm -hmm. But the moment you prove it wrong, then obviously it's no longer valid. So there's no point to hold on to it. So it's a placeholder. That's how, my, how I choose to look at my mental software. To mm -hmm. use another simple analogy, right? We human beings supposedly are the most intelligent species on this planet. I have doubts about that, but that's a whole different conversation. Point being is that if we use smartphones nowadays, with what platform you use, I don't care, right? This plat not platform specific. And there are constant updates for the software, almost like on a monthly basis. And that's a smart device. And we're the smartest and we make it. How often do we make the effort to update our mental software? Mm -hmm. So that's my mindset. Constant updates. <laughs> Constant updates. Because there's always something you don't know. The more you learn about anything and you're humble in your beginner's mind, the more you realize how little do you know about anything and how ignorant you are. The moment mm -hmm. you lose this beginner's mindset is the moment you basically have a mindset that is concretized, meaning like it's one way or another is going to limit your progress because you see what is a mindset useful to, right? Mm -hmm. To solve your problems. And a problem is nothing but a, pro, a prompt to probe your perspective. Okay. Hence, always challenge your mindsets. Always, 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 always. Never take anything for granted. There are no absolutes in this relative universe. Mm -hmm. Everything is constantly evolving and so should be your mindsets because there are no limitations on the, on the amount of expansion you can have on the mental plane. Let's put it that way. Well, and this question was made in order to, like, this question was put together, I have it as my first one, to see how people have evolved over the last five years. It wasn't really so much about the mindset, but how has your mindset evolved, or how has you as a person evolved? And uh, I think that's, yeah. Well, it's, uh, it, if, if I was to say how I have evolved in five years, man, it's like black and white. It's, although I've kept all the best pieces, it's mm -hmm. the the... For five years, the amount of growth and expansion, it's not just in mindset. Again, because I don't, I'm not a theorist. Mm -hmm. I'm a practical, natural scientist in the sense of when I learn something, I go and test it out. I see if it produces results. It's, it's valid. I don't just satisfy it with consuming theory and being intellectually knowledgeable about things. I go and test them out. I see if they're valid or not. So being that 
for five years, you can imagine I've learned so many things, stumbled upon so many things, experimented with so many things. Like mm -hmm. it's really hard to compare who I was five years ago with who I am today. Although in, in many ways, again, I've kept the best pieces that work for me. As you probably should, as we evolve as people, we're trying to keep leveling up in a way. And by learning from our mistakes and relearning and unlearning allows us to become better human beings. Oh yeah. Well, we are in art school. <laughs> school never ends. You never we're, graduate. You're in the right place. Uh, one question I have here too is what was it like growing up in Bulgaria? Just as someone is from the US, I was curious about that. Uh, well, it's, it, honestly, that's a very good question. And the, the simplest way to describe it is imagine what would have America been like in the 80s, right? Because I grew up in the 80s or like mid to like I was born in the mid 80s and we Bulgaria for a long time after the Second World War was a communist country or a socialist country or whatever you want to call it, right? Mm -hmm. Point being, it was a very different type of structure and so on. And right about when I was four or five years old or becoming very aware of the environment and so on as a little child, the communism, you know, fell apart and we had what I call a uh, early form of wild, wild, wild democracy. So basically it was no limits on what you can do. As long as you had the money to pay for what you want, you can have it your way. We, me and my buddies used to copy or model what the grown-ups did in my neighborhood. And when I say the grown-ups, maybe like 18, 20 year old men, smoke cigarettes, drink, gamble, play pool, uh, mm -hmm. you know, things that here in America, a kid, you know, if they see you somewhere first, they're going to shut down the whole venue that they allow a little child to gamble or smoke or purchase alcohol or, you know, you name it, not just to have the kid inside. So it's very different paradigm. I had full access to anything mm. a grown up in America has to wait to be 21 to have access to and to try and experiment with and obviously learn the hard way, right? Mm -hmm. So it was very contrasting to what would have been if I was to grow up in America. Great contrast. And I mean, like, I cannot exaggerate the contrast. Mm -hmm. It was humongous, great contrast. And obviously being an early democracy after... 50 years or something of that sort of, of socialism or communism or whatever you want to call it, there was not many Western goods or goods that came from somewhere else. So it was very limited into like the consumer items you can buy. So from that perspective, it wasn't like as, you know, mind blowing as it would have been here. Well, and I definitely, I wonder too, like just, growing up there with all that freedom to do those things and to experiment with those things, you learn pretty quickly that like, okay, if I drink, if I'm not going to feel good, or if I drink too much, it could be bad. And then as you get older, you learn the effects of alcohol or cigarettes and stuff like that. But I was curious to see how that might've been for you. And if there was any struggles or something like that, and it seems like it's pretty hard to understand from my own perspective, but I empathize with just having that journey. Yeah, well, it, it was honestly, I wouldn't change it for anything. I think I was blessed because not only because of those circumstances and the opportunity I had to have access to all these things and not just me, me and my friends, we were just, you know, you can imagine I used to live in what they will call like a projects building in what, you know, in uh, mm -hmm. Bronx or something like a tall, big building with many apartments and there are a lot of kids in my age group. And we all hang out all day, smoke cigarettes and play all kinds of crazy stuff. No zero adult supervision. And I mean, zero, my parents would, you know, leave me, I would say, leave me in a sense, like they go to their business and all that kind of stuff. You know, they, they had zero worries that something bad could happen and all that stuff that parents nowadays deal here in the Western world. You know, mm -hmm. the constant negative news, right? CNN stands for constant negative news. Uh, if you don't know yet, 
and it's I'm how the surprised. system works to keep you always in fight or flight response. <laughs> if you watch the news or consume any, what I would call propaganda, mainstream propaganda, the point being there was none of that. So my parents, they leave in the morning and they don't come until 10 o'clock at night. And mm -hmm. at 10 o'clock, dark, we've been playing all day. I made food for myself, went to school, did my homework, whatever the hell mm -hmm. it is. Most of it wasn't doing homework. It was hanging out with my buddies and, you know, skateboarding. Pretty self -reliant, doing yeah. something, going to the arcades, playing games. But it was extremely, again, like a wild, wild west democracy in the 80s. That's the simplest way to, to describe it, so to speak. Well, going from that more, like you said, Wild West kind of style and just really self-reliant life, you've become more of a philosophical person and someone who's trying to learn autodidactic and seems like you're rather blissful. And that kind of makes me think about what is it, how can you explain what a bliss coach is, for example, as something that you talk about in your content? What is a bliss coach? Sure. Well, first thing, the generally speaking, Westerners do not understand the meaning of bliss, what bliss okay. is. Bl let me first give you uh, the kind of like the dictionary description of what the true meaning of bliss is from the Eastern world, where, you know, it's a big part of the spiritual teachings and practices and so on. And it's one of the, let me put it this way, one of the most priceless gifts you receive by practicing certain methodologies for what I call working out from the inside out. But bliss is a state of permanent peace, fulfillment and satisfaction. It's basically a state that doesn't move or fluctuate from, from moods. It's not a mood. It's a permanent state. It's some, it's a state where you constantly at peace, constantly content and you can stand unshaken amidst a crash of breaking worlds to put it lightly meaning like you're independent of your external circumstances doesn't matter if life gives you lemons you make mm -hmm. the most delicious lemonade if life gives you ripe fruit you enjoy it doesn't matter you're what the masters or advanced Eastern master would say equanimous, meaning like you're unaffected your environment. Whatever the environment is, you're beyond that. You've already mm. established, anchored yourself in a state that's beyond that, that doesn't fluctuate like everything else in a relative universe that fluctuates from day and night, low tide, high tide, full moon, no moon, inhale, exhale, eat excrete, it doesn't fluctuate. It's a constant state. It's very, let me put it this way. Once you've tasted that, you don't want to have anything else in your life. No, like most desire starts to like wane down because you see how futile they are and what they give you. And there's nothing wrong with being happy or excited or elated. So it's not a state of elation. It's not a state of like extreme happiness. It's a very peaceful state of contentment. You basically, you can be sitting in the middle of a forest somewhere with nothing. And I mean nothing, butt naked, hungry, and you'll be fully blissed the fuck out. That's what bliss is. And it's once you've anchored yourself in that state, because at first, through certain practice, by little, little, by little, you establish your residency there, right? And then you can visit the normal world where you can be happy today, sad tomorrow, and this kind of thing. But the moment you reach a level or degree of self-mastery, moods disappear because you all already have greater will than that. You can will yourself to feel however you want. The circumstances no longer of your life no longer dictate how you feel. You choose how to feel because it's within your control. Because the only thing that gets upset within a human experience is the expectation people place on things. And then if things don't go according to plan, because they never do, they get upset, right? So if you look at life as this 
constantly unfolding game where you're going to have like a game of chess. You're going to have black squares and white squares. You have to play both. You cannot just step on, wild, on the whites or the blacks. You're going to have to always dribble in between. And that's how life revolves if you choose to follow that path. Meaning you're going to oscillate. Just like the moon oscillates in its phases, ocean tides, the human physiology, the seasons of the year, and so on, unless you elevate your experience beyond that. So that's what, what bliss is. It's an inner state of perfect content, contentment at any point in time, with, regardless of your circumstances unmovable objects from external and internal stimuli. Exactly. Because it's something within. It's something that we already are in our true essence. There are four things that our true essence, and when I say our true essence, is that eternal element within us all that right now sits, listens, and is comprehending. It's conscious that it's being. It's conscious that it's seeing, that it's listening, that it's processing information, that it exists in space and time, that part within us is transcendental. It's eternal. It has no beginning, has no end, has no label, has no gender, has no nationality in any of those things. And it has four inbuilt qualities that are not something it has to get. It's something part of what it is. So when you find this within you, and they call it the self, capital letters, self, what the true self is, there are four inbuilt qualities. Wisdom, joy, peace, and, and love. That's the mm -hmm. other one. They are already pouring without, meaning they're coming from the inside out because that's what you are in your essence. However, over many lifetimes, not just one lifetime, because we live many, many lifetimes, we are conditioned with all these layers, 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 layers of dirt that the, what I call working out from the inside out process allows you to get rid of. So kind of like, a, you know, if you take a simple analogy, if we are to take a piece of coal, it's okay. dirty, it's black, but once you heat it up to a certain degree, it starts to glow pretty bright. So this, the whole process of, you know, heating up the coat and I mean the coal and starting to shine real bright. That's really the process. And something that I actually talked about a long time ago was this idea of world unity through self-development by working from the individual out, you could help the world. And I feel like that's a bigger scale of what you're talking about, kind of like on the inside, working your way out to help that person. That self-development is a way to make that person appear more effective at being a human being. And if we could do that for each person, that'll help the world itself become better from the inside. Well, absolutely, because it's all by example. If there are no healthy, highly functioning examples out, out there for people to aspire to be, it's very hard to go from the mainstream mediocrity that is all about comfort and compliance to doing something that is uncomfortable. Because in order to reach that state, you have to do a lot of things that are uncomfortable to the ego or which one would call what I would call and spiritual practitioners would call the false self or the personality. Because the personality is like a ball of Play-Doh. However, for most people, it's like a piece of concrete. But They're once you learn that the personality is as flexible as your will to act upon <laughs> new things is in your mind to think of yourself as something greater or different than what you are. I don't care what you define yourself as or definition of self is because identity is critical, but like point being, you can change this. It's like a Play-Doh. If you're not happy with what it is, go ahead and reinvent yourself because human beings are wired to behave 
in consistence with their self or sense of self identity. In my case, I am case closed. And, a and lot then of I can oh. add any label I want to. I can, <laughs> in other terms, I'm anything and everything. I have to be at any given moment in order to express this mm -hmm. inner light. Maybe sometimes I have to be very, let's say, gentle and, and kind. And some other point with a client, for example, in a coaching situation where I, you know, I don't use ego bound. <laughs> I have to like operate very, very decisively and point out to them that you have a very dramatic blind spot here that you need to address. So I cannot go about it very subtly. We have to like <laughs> get rid of yeah. it now yeah. kind Cut of deal, tumor, right? if you will. <laughs> yeah. So we have to, so point being, I can be anything and everything. So, so so can you point being that this false identity is very flexible and there's nothing wrong with it, but you have to understand that it's like a play doh. You can mold it however you want. It's not limited. It's not done. It's not, you are not what you think you are. Or you define yourself as people are malleable and the people who are not as much are the ones more stuck in their ways. They don't think they can change. And when they think that, they start to make it more true. And a lot of it stems from fear of who they might become, despite the fact it's a, more than likely a better version. But the thing is, they stop themselves before they even try. Well, there's fundamental needs that the human psyche has. And one of the Fun, like the most fundamental of them is certainty. And most majority of people are satisfied with being certain with the way they are, although they don't necessarily give them joy or work for them. Instead of going into the unknown, stepping into the known, because the Achilles heel of the ego or the false identity are two things, uncertainty and inadequacy and unless you have a deep belief first because everything again we install a belief right that's how we start when we upgrade someone's mental software and stretch their mindset mm -hmm. we install a belief again it's a theory or a hypothesis a assumption a placeholder the more energy they give into it and decide to act upon it and validate it for themselves, the more real mm. it becomes that there is a different dimension beyond this that they actually are. And once you have something to compare it to, because the way we are wired and consciousness is wired is always in relation to something else. Because if, unless there is change of state, we don't perceive anything. We're just in this space where nothing changes. There always have to be relativity in order for consciousness to function. So we need to have something else to compare it to. And once we do, and we see that there is another dimension to us, the transition becomes not easier, but a lot more doable and acceptable because you have to go through this, what I call the no man's land, where it's going to be uncomfortable because you just, it's a no man's land. You've never been there. And there is usually no evidence within you or direct experience. So you have to, again, take my word for it or somebody else and use your intuition kind of like your, or what an person who's not familiar with what really intuition is like instinct to kind of like, ah, oh, maybe that really makes some sense. So I'll give it a shot. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's how I was early on in my process of experimenting with all kinds of different modalities to see what really works, what is highly effective, what is kind of like the slow path and so on and so on. Right. And what is more universal when it, you can use in a scientific method, meaning that, Sure. When applied, it constantly delivers results.
definitely makes sense. And it seems like the evolution of people, this really comes down from the internal source and how you interact with that and how you choose to accept it. But going to this next question here, you have a few descriptors that set you apart, biohacker, maverick, polymath, from, which is how I found you. What are your thoughts on those terms and words? Uh, well, they're just terms that help others to kind of like have an understanding of the type of things I do or I can do for them or so to mm. speak. Because here in the Western world, people are conditioned to define themselves with the work they do in the world. Mm. I, I don't know how much traveling you have done, but if you go to Europe or Asia, people rarely would ask you, what do you do? What job do you have? Like, you, you know what I mean? What do you do for a living? In America, that's usually where you go to any event. That's probably one of the first or the second question to ask you after your name. What do you do? Hmm. Well, I'm not what I do. These are things I do, but that's not me because I'm a human being, not a human doing, right? Okay. So what I do is going to tell you very little of who and how I am. You have to spend time with me to really understand that but point being these are just descriptors that offer some ideas of the i guess the plethora of things i like to do right that i come i wouldn't even call it natural to me it's like mm -hmm. i don't even hard it's not like i'm trying hard right it's not something i have to put effort into it's something that just you know i enjoy doing all these things because i have the the blessing in my life to have the freedom of choice to do the things I want to do, right? Yeah. To live a lifestyle by design, intentionally created life. That is, I do the things I enjoy doing and I know I'm good at as well. Not that I don't play upon my weaknesses or working on certain things that I know needs to be fine tuned and upgraded, but I do use my talents because that's where my strengths lie. I have certain gifts. And if I don't use them, it's like a, almost like if I wasted my existence on this planet because God bless us with specific gifts so we can bless others, not to call them. And one of the greatest blessing is when you discover what your true gifts are and a meaningful way to share them with the world or use them in a positive way yeah. where you can have an influence on the world that makes difference even in one person's life because mm -hmm. that's already a great achievement and many people that do want to do good in the world get stuck with this thing like oh i want to help many people well first help, help one person at a time right mm. and then eventually as you figure things out and how your talents work and so on i'm sure you'll find a system that helps you to have even greater positive influence yeah. on the world. But you have to start small. You cannot think of the ocean first, right? Nobody in life starts running. We always first crawl and then make <laughs> gradual steps, fall down and tumble down many times and walk like we are on like, like a moonwalk kind of deal for some time. And then eventually we learn to run and it's like we don't even think about it, right? Same with that. Like for me, I'm a coach. I taught swimming for most of my life, adult life at least. And I started out with just a couple swim lessons and you do a few more. At this point, it's been a decade. It's been about a thousand people. I'm hoping to teach even more than that over the course of my life. And it's, like you said, start somewhere and build up over time. Yeah, yeah, no, find what the best tip I can give you about this. There's something everybody has that. And it's all, it's different for every person, but there's yeah. something that when you do and you don't do for you, but you do for others to in some way to enrich the life of somebody else, whether you're an entertainer, whether you're somebody who has actually providing a service of, of a coach or healing or whatever it is that makes you like come alive. Like you can do it all day and you don't care if you get even get paid, right? That's your area to focus on and figure out how you can turn this into a sustainable business that you can earn 
obviously sufficient income to su supply yourself. But yeah. generally speaking, as you give, show, so shall uh, you will receive. The system works like that. The more you give, the more it comes back to you. And let me put it this way, magical ways. So I'm going to share a story with you or something to like give you real evidence of that. But I on Saturdays, I have a habit that has been for years. I go every Saturday morning to the local farmer's market because that's where I get most of the food that I consume, which happens to be raw vegetables and fruits mostly that are mm -hmm. all in season, all fresh, delicious, mind-blowing. I highly recommend you check your local, uh, local farmer's market if you haven't yet been. Uh, obviously, if you live in an area where it's cold, maybe the selection right now won't be great, but it's still not too late. Point being, I went to the market and there was, there's always little boots of some organizations doing something, right? Some of them are for profit, some are non-profit. This was a non-profit one and had like a very cute little llama mascot <laughs> that attracted my attention. So I stopped by and like, it was a man and a, and a woman. And so they explained to me that there were um, a charitable organization that offers mental health services for free to whoever needs to reach out and needs help right and that's a great you know service to have nowadays because so many people are struggling with their yeah mental space so i spoke with them for a moment but i was in a rush because i had to make it to my college class i'm actually you know 39 today or like you know almost gonna get into my 40s very soon but i'm taking college classes this fall just to expand my toolbox mm -hmm. or my presence and ability and so i uh, had a little bit of a rush but i'm never in a rush because time works for me but point being i went to the farmer who i buy my tomatoes from and that lady was there and she was like she recognized me right away and she was like with a bag in her head hey have you ever had these like a bag mm -hmm. of tomatoes and i was like yeah they're delicious and they were like well showing me her credit card in the other hand like well, they don't take credit cards. Oh. So she left them and just, I guess, ran back to her somewhere else or to her boot or whatever. But I was like, hey, hey, hold on, hold on. I'll buy them for you because it was the, the right oh. thing to do. Like, there's no right. problem. I'll just, you know, if you can pay for it, I'll just get it for you. No worries. But she just disappeared. So I picked up my tomatoes and got her back because they were already still staying there. And... I was making my way to, to where the, the farmer is to, to, to pay him. And the moment I was putting my hand in my pocket to, to right. pull my money, I looked down, there was a $20 bill right in front of my face. Mm. So sometimes it's as it's, it's immediate as that. Because the gift of giving keeps on giving. And giving, I'll explain something very important. Giving is not a transaction. It's something that's unconditional. Meaning that you don't expect anything in return. You just give because you can today. Because who knows if tomorrow you're going to be here. Yeah. We all, you know, nowadays I walk, do something, you know, because I'm always aware and present in what they would call in the moment. But point being, people are always rushing, always rushing, always rushing to here and there and this and that. Like life is the race to the grave because that's what's going to happen to every, each and everybody that's living on this planet. I don't know what, I don't care what your religion is and blah, 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 and all these things or nationality. Eventually this body has one destination. That's the grave. So what's the point rushing to it, right? Yeah. Might as well slow down and smell the roses as they say. Point being, I'm always in that state and yeah. learning to give without expecting anything in return and when I say gift, it doesn't have to be something physical, right? It doesn't have to be money. It doesn't have to be a gift of any physical value or any financial value. It can be a, a hug. Mm -hmm. It can be just your attention listening to somebody, really being present with them and listening to what they have to say. Maybe it's just a genuine smile. But when you do it unconditionally, you're going to see in some magical way how the system brings it back to you because that's how the system works. And this 
works and applies in any aspect of life. So what I want to ex exaggerate here is learning how to do this is going to take your life from whatever level is right now to extraordinary. Because now you've applied one of the fundamental laws that govern this universe. And you can either work the law or the, the law will work against you. Yeah. But most people, you know, generally speaking, when they give, they expect something in return. It's still a transaction. It's like if I went to the grocery store to buy milk, right? Yeah. I need to pay. And when I pay at the register, I expect to receive a carton of milk or whatever. And when you said law too, it makes me think of the Dow, but yeah. So something I ask all my guests is what is a polymath to you? Ah, uh, polymath to me, the simplest way to describe it is how someone who has a incurable curiosity disease <laughs> that is spreading incurable. Like, everywhere right it's not just it one dimensional but it's like globally spread so to speak mm -hmm. to me it's somebody who is truly curious about how all the pieces of everything fit together is mm -hmm. looking at the big picture not just at the small details and there's nothing wrong with going granular and detailed focus that's part of the of the journey as well if you truly want to be fully integrated into the polymath aspect because what the ancient advanced masters would say is that a fully realized master or a human being who has reached its full potential, realize its potential, and now it's expressing the omnipotent, omniscient, divine capabilities that are present and latent within us all, are seven rays. One is a scientist. Another one is a philosopher. Another one is a devotee or like a lover of the divine or somebody who can pray and just have this mystical experience another mm. one is an artist you can be a musician you can paint pictures and there the the other one is uh i forgot the, the other three but there's seven two of them so in my humble opinion and experience is that somebody who's like can do a lot of these things because if you look at history, Da Vinci is a great example of that. He was capable in many, many different skills yeah. and sciences or understanding at a time, which actually contributed to the amazing art he created. He kind of like, oh, he, he was interested in all these different dimensions, but he focused it in one specific degree, but he was still mm -hmm. using all these, the pers perspectives of dimension and so on and understanding geometry, human bodies, the, yeah, he went enemy. all the way to create these amazing pieces of art, right? Yeah. He was an artist, but he also understood the greater workings and laws mm -hmm. and patterns in the universe to, to the degree that he was interested to. And, Obviously, he had many inventions too. There was all these interesting. He he had a he, helicopter yeah. sketch before, you know, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Huh? Yeah. yeah, all kinds of stuff. But he's one of the most, like to me, most uh, interesting polymath that we know of, or at least have some uh, historical record and information mm -hmm. about. And obviously, it's great that he had kept all these great journals and stuff that we can look at today and be like, wow, this guy was a freaking genius, right? <laughs> so many things. Yeah. He is my hero. Anytime someone brings him up on the show, it always brings me a little bit of joy to hearing his name be, especially someone who understands too. He wasn't just a painter. And I think they said that somewhere upwards of 15 different disciplines he was an expert in, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. Not kind of crazy. It is crazy. Well, I would <laughs> imagine, you know, it would have, kept on like myself and you, he would have kept on learning new and new things if he had the time to do it and the lifespan to, 
to do it. Or just the opportunities that we have now too. We live in such a information free age where we can learn so quickly and easily and accessibly. And so had he just had that, ooh, just imagine. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would like, I mean, seriously, like I still have so many things. And when I mean so many things, whether it's documentaries or courses or books or whatever you want to call it on my queue. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, I guess, prioritizing based on yeah. my current main priorities are what is the pieces that would really propel me the most forward in, in that towards that goal. But it's always, it's always changing. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, no, absolutely. Yeah. I actually created a system called the modular degree, this do it yourself education for people like us. And just like you said there, it's always changing. And it's just one of those things where the, the courses you take or the podcast you listen to, or the show, the shows you watch, the YouTube videos you watch, all these different things. It's a system to help you track that. And I actually first, initially built it in Google Sheets. And so, I mean, you essentially like Excel. And so, yeah, it's one of those things where that's what got me into that whole system of creating that life OS. So I totally understand what you're saying there. I, I love that. Nice. So expand a little bit more on the system. It's uh, yeah. something that others can use to organize their Definitely. learning process. Is that what it is? Yeah, I need to make a template for people using it in Google Sheets or Excel, but I made a template in Notion and I'll tend to make it in other tools as well for people to download. But in Notion, you can download a template right now. And it's just one of those things where it's more of also a mindset of approaching a modular education too, because people are not keeping track of what they're learning. And something you kind of mentioned about earlier in the past, uh, at the beginning of the episode, I mean, you were talking about you know changing your mindset and changing what bias you might have. And you can't be stone, you have to be more like Plato. And that modular mindset, if you will, or maybe not mindset side, or the modular approach allows you to keep changing. And so learning, but also relearning certain things too, because maybe you forgot something you learned a while back, but unlearning things that might no longer be helpful to you, or perhaps are incorrect because we found out more information and having that process of learning, relearning and unlearning and having a system to actually cater to that too, and cater to your divergent interest pool. Because you're not going to just be interested in one thing. You might be interested in 10 different things at once or maybe just two. But having something that can change based on that. Yeah, no, that's that's wonderful, obviously. I mean, well, part of the, the research I've been doing lately is that as we go through life, there is a great misconception in the general public and culture and so on that once you like 18 or whatever, once you go through your childhood and, you know, <laughs> process and you teenage years and so on and you're like 18 20 you like be adult now but the actual truth is that whether you're female or male you, each and every one is going through specific developmental stages mm -hmm. and they're most and what i mean by this they're psychological they're yeah. ex internal things so they're in different phases and age general ages there the priorities of a human being switch and based on that obviously what you're gonna be learning or interested in learning that can help you to handle the or be successful to achieve that priority at that moment is gonna yeah. vary it's not set in stone and uh it's great to specialize in something but you can really uh, get too far down the rabbit hole and mm -hmm. find yourself in a position where you stuck at where you are and discover at some point in life that this is wasn't your choice because you made it very early in life but you uh, invested so much time and effort to reach that point now you're almost like Oh, but it's how can I give this right? Give, like, how can I let go and move into something else that now mm -hmm. with what I know and the insight about myself and so on, I know it's no longer in alignment with me and I know what I'm drawn to. Like, do I mm -hmm. want to live a life of this internal conflict that pulls you in one direction and another one just holds you like an anchor mm -hmm. you want to let go? So having this multi-disciplinary 
approach to studying and not just studying, but exploring different, whether it's vocations or mm. potential businesses and so on, I think it's very valuable because unless you have a, a highly advanced self-awareness, it's going to take you a while going through kind of life to figure out really what revs your heart, so to speak. Yeah and where your strengths lie and so on and so on. So approaching things in a more open-minded, again, expansive and diverse way would definitely aid you in that journey. So you won't find yourself in a place where you, you stuck in a rut that you know you don't like and you feel stuck at. Well, and something you mentioned there about being stuck and just putting down that rabbit hole so much, Sometimes people refer to different disciplines as trenches. Like you put so much, you're digging into one trench and that is your, that's your discipline, that's your specialty. But you dig yourself so deep, you can no longer see over the hole. And so you can no longer see the bigger picture outside of you. And which is why when you're multidisciplinary, you're digging multiple trenches, you can have that ability to jump between them and to be able to see the bigger picture because you have dug multiple trenches. But if you hyper specialize too much, you dig your trench too too low, and it becomes harder to get out and try something new and explore something new. The, the trenches can be deep yeah. and treacherous. Yeah. <laughs> well, and so yeah. one thing I actually want to ask you too, and given that you're wearing the shirt, which is perfect, what is Flow Mighty? Flow Mighty is an absolutely awesome wellness product I developed this year, early this year. And I had a soft launch. Initially, it was tailored towards high performers or high performers who want to be in peak state, no matter what they did. However, I discovered that throughout the experimentation and doing a lot of feed, like uh, focus groups and stuff with people is that the most pressing concern that most people have and the product can uh, actually help them with it's a pocket spray you take with you anywhere you want. It contains 50, 15 uh, blend of 15 pure essential oils that you inhale in a specific way that allow you or empower you to, as a speaker, as a presenter, <laughs> an actor on stage, anybody who's up to public speaking some way, somehow, or on stage presenting in front of, of others mm -hmm. to have presence, peace and potency, or what I say mm -hmm. to tell well and excel. Because one of the number one f fears that humans have across the globe is public speaking. Yeah, I actually had to do it just this past weekend, so I totally get it. <laughs> So the product is designed hmm. to what scientists or brain scientists would call hyperfrontality, meaning like you through a specific breath work and inhaling it from your palms, because this is how you, how you use the product. It puts you in this hyperfrontal state where basically you lose the ego the awareness or the concern of what people are thinking of you and you're very peaceful and grounded so you can channel your best presence energy uh well speech and so yeah. on but point being it helps you to overcome this fright and yeah. to tell well and excel it's a uh, very sweet little product I've developed that I've been using for years, not necessarily for stage fright, but it just generally speaking for general wellness when I exercise and when I just want to have a breath of fresh air. Even. Yeah. While it's natural to get into the state of flow for depending on the challenge, being able to enhance the arrival into that state using the product would actually be, that would have been really helpful because I was doing an MC for a wedding, for example, and I'm not used to, first off, emceeing that much, but also being in front of that many people and speaking. That's just a prime example of being in the state of flow. I think eventually I got into the flow state, but that was already past halfway at that point. And so it would have been helpful to get that from the beginning. So 
Oh the, yeah. The flow yeah, state absolutely. is definitely something. I'm actually with something that's very interesting. I'm uh, what I was uh, to kind of expand on what I was saying earlier. Like this fall semester, I'm taking three different classes. <laughs> acting related classes in, in a local college because they have a theater arts department. Mm. So I'm taking these classes just to be better as a speaker, to be more present, to have better voice and so on and body language. So I'm taking three different classes. Mm -hmm. One is basic acting. The other one is voice development and mm. the other one being using the body as a tool of communication. So, just so it's been very interesting to have this, uh, like almost like an intimate view into the world and the psychology of the actor, because I, it, each class, there are at least 30 other people with me. Mm -hmm. Right. And I can see because I'm a expert in human behavior and physiology, I can read what's going on in their heads and their bodies right away. I don't need to go and ask them. I know when they're like, in panic or like in stage fright and just, you know, having these <laughs> almost like panic attacks, if you want to call it, like, it's just very interesting. So I've been experimenting with them, using them as my, uh, part of my research feedback, sort of loop feedback loop to see how it actually helps them and affects them in a positive way and helps them to shift yeah. into being capable and really free and just joyful actors on stage or speakers. Right now it's just with actors, but it will be as applicable to speakers or anybody to who, anyone you know, yeah. ever gets on stage to do something. It's also helpful to just be aware of that. And as a host, for example, I try to make sure I look at the camera, nod, acknowledge what the person is saying. Those, like you just nodded when I just, I just said too. And it's just one of those things where as communicators, it's helpful to just understand the other person's mentality on that, based on that. So it's always interesting to think about, especially when you're on camera, let alone in front of real life people. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's fascinating. I highly recommend oh, yeah. it to anybody. Taking an uh, acting class, not just not for the sake of acting, but just to be a better in the moment person. Because in order to be a good actor, you have to be present in the moment. You cannot be thinking your way through it. You have to be like a little child. Mm -hmm. The most effective actors, in my personal opinion, like I never sit down to, to examine them and speak with them in detail to see what their acting process is, but it's those who see acting as a childish play where you really imagine that you are playing this game as we all did when we were <laughs> kids, you know, playing something with a stick in your hand. Maybe you're a knight, maybe you, you're a, a wizard, whatever the hell it was, but you so bowed into this thing that you're playing that you no longer thought or had a moment in time to think of like who you actually are in your real life. You just so caught up in the illusion of playing this role, whatever that is. And it, it really comes down to that. And it, being able to improvise on your toes, especially if you're a businessman or anything like that, and you know whether you're presenting to investors or you're selling to a big client or you meet the, the woman of, of, of your dreams and you want to go say hi, it's absolutely amazing. So I highly recommend it to anybody who, who you know, is curious and especially if you're polymatic, obviously it would be a great dimension to expand upon and just explore because to me it's like a child's play and it's a very practical thing. It's not sitting down and studying theory, yeah. which I'm a pragmatic person to me. The practical application of the knowledge mm. I acquire is critical. If it has no practical application, if it's just bah. theories, I don't want to know about it. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not relevant <laughs> to me. Uh, if I cannot put it into practice and test it out, and how would it, I yeah. know whether or not it's true? What a great valid. point to make, Martin. That's good. Especially going from flow into being in the moment as an actor. Like These are all great points. Where could people find you and find more Flow Mighty stuff too? The best place to start would be flowmighty.com. Purchase yours and start using it. You'll be amazed of what inhaling and 
not only inhaling the essential oils, but following the little breathwork technique, I have developed hand in hand or to go and particularly enhance the effectiveness of these essential oils can do for your how immediately your change of state can be. It's almost instantaneous. Like, mm -hmm. I kid you not. And obviously, if you keep on using the product and practicing the breath work, you're going to actually develop the most effective habit of breathing, which is fundamental. Because the one thing that is critical to our proper functioning of our body is knowing how to breathe in the most optimal and correct way. Because that in itself is a source for great suffering in people's life because they're breathing in a highly dysfunctional way that not only doesn't provide sufficient supply of oxygen in the system, but also generates cortisol and adrenaline and mm. keeps panic mm -hmm. or fight or flight response. So just that in itself <laughs> would blow your mind. So Point being, go get yours, experiment, and then other place to explore my work and how I can be of value to you because I'm always looking forward to being of service and add value in any shape or form is to go to my website, martinchristov.com, which is spelled M-A-R-T-I-N-H-R-I-S-T-O-V.com. Mm -hmm. I love how you explained it out too, because I'm going to have links in the description, but in case someone's listening in, they'll know what to look for. Thank you, Martin Ristoff, to comment on the Polymath Polycast. Thank you, Dustin. It was a great conversation. It's always amazing to, to connect with you and share what comes at the moment. Yeah, going with the flow. Innovators crave innovative products, which is exactly why the Polymath Polycast is powered by Riverside.fm.